He has joined us from London, and he is the founder and director of Next Gen Digital. Uh, so Barry is founder, and he's uh, I mean a uh, uh, London growth marketing. So I explained the Next Gen Digital is a London-based growth marketing consultancy that provides growth marketing services to startups and small businesses. Uh, so Barry is a 20 years um, experience marketing veteran. And he has worked for industry leaders in various marketing capacities in addition to delivering marketing projects for the banking, hospitality, petrochemical verticals in India, the Middle East, and in the UK. So he was in Bangalore for a very long time. Correct me if I'm wrong, Barry. Uh, not for a very long time. I was in Bangalore for a couple of years, uh, in the late 90s, actually. Late, when late Bangalore 90s. was a lot different than what it is today. <laughs> And apart from multiple public speaking gigs to his credit, Barry also provides consulting and mentoring to startups to help them achieve their business goals. Um, he's here to talk up about his journey as a marketer and to share his view and insights on the topic that we'll be uh, discussing. Yeah. So, uh, question to you, Barry. Um, how the brands have been able to use tech and show their human side uh, during COVID-19 pandemic? Okay, so uh, once again, thanks, uh, Rohit and the team at uh, Beyond Imagination. Uh, can you hear me? Sorry. Cause, yeah. Yeah, right. So um, this, the, you know, the whole digital transformation and digital marketing and digital technology and, and then all that intertwined with COVID-19 is these have been subjects that have been talked about for quite a while, uh, especially in the last six months. So I'm going to I'm going to actually, uh, you know, first, I want to talk about how how brands are embracing the human side and, and using technology to sort of, you know, um, impact um, their customer base and their fans in a very positive way. So we all know that, you know, the crisis, the COVID-19 crisis hit global, global economies big time, right? Everyone's pretty much affected. Um, and it's a threat to everyone. It's a threat to individuals, it's a threat to organizations, but a few organizations have stepped up to the challenge and they're the ones that are essentially creating a legacy for themselves in, in these very trying uh, times. Now, right here in the UK, we, we have organizations like the NHS and, and a lot of the top government, top tier government organizations that are doing a really good job. But then one would say they're expected to do a good job because that's, that's their role. Uh, I, I don't agree with it entirely because there's always, you know, things that you can do beyond what your, what your line, what your uh, duties and responsibilities are. Uh, but I'm not going to address what the NHS and all those guys are doing. I want to address what, you know, what, what other brands are doing. Brands like supermarkets, like Tesco's and Sainsbury's. Uh, you know, the, the, these are the brands, they, they were the first people to respond during the pandemic. They were the first people to have their, have their staff work extra to bring in new stock to make sure that their, their, their stores were, uh, their, their, their shelves are with, with the, the necessities. Uh, they were the ones that, were, that had enough uh, volunteers manning uh, different stations and making sure that social distancing was, uh, was being followed. Uh, uh, and then, and then there's 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 these other brands. There's these other smaller companies. Uh, for instance, I don't know if you guys have heard of the company, a little known company called Leon. They're they're quite popular here, especially in London. They're a chain of small uh, coffee shops, kind of like Starbucks, but a little bit smaller. And uh, what they did was initially, uh, as soon as the lockdown was announced, as soon as the pandemic, as soon as it was declared a pandemic, they said we're going to give 50% discount on all meals to all NHS workers with an ID. Not only that, but their CEO kind of put together a consortium of uh, restaurant suppliers uh, and, and food suppliers, and they were kind of giving away free food to critical care workers within the NHS, right? Uh, then there's another really small company called Brompton Bicycles. They rent bicycles to people uh, in London. I don't know if they do it outside London, but they do it within London. Uh, they offered about two or 300 uh, foldable bikes for free to NHS workers during the crisis because, you know, the people were scared of taking public transportation. So they said, you know what, we're going to give you these bikes. Obviously, there was a qualification criteria because your boss or your supervisor had to, had to recommend it. But they gave away those free bikes. Uh, no, no additional cost. Uh, and then you look at the slightly commercial side of it. Uh, if you've heard of this uh, beer company called Brewdog, they're based in Scotland. And they're really, really good. They make a lot of really good beers for those of you guys that are beer drinkers out there. What they did was they said, well, people are not drinking as much. We're going to take our facilities, make a few modifications, and we're going to start manufacturing hand sanitizer, right? Because the hand sanitizers were, were 
very much needed. You would go to any any shop, any supermarket, any pharmacy, and it was really hard to get your uh, get hand sanitizer. So they started making those hand sanitizers, and it turned out to be a very practical solution to a genuine problem. And this kind of helped them build their trust and their loyalty. Right? Even people that drank other beers kind of gravitated towards Brewdog because they 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 felt a kind of kinship with them. You know, uh, and then you had other brands worldwide like Leg, you know, Lego. You know, Lego started giving, uh, giving, giving away free uh, toys to kids because they wanted them to stay home but still experience the, the beauty of childhood, uh, we, you, know, we, you know, keeping, keeping safety uh, in mind, obviously. McDonald's addressed the issues of, of uh, social distancing and they actually told people why they're closing down their stores. And this is one thing that I think a lot of brands don't get when something like this happens, when there's a pandemic, when there's even a, a situation that applies just to your brand or your organization, it's really important that you communicate so that people know what's going on. Um, so these are brands that are coming to mind uh, right away. I'm sure there's like tons, thousands of brands that have done their job, done their bit. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, the fundamental principle that Gary Vaynerchuk, I don't know if you guys are familiar or some of the listeners might be familiar with Gary Vaynerchuk. Uh, he talks about one fundamental principle to, to, to you know, making sure that your business succeeds. And that is, care, right? Brands that I've just mentioned are capitalizing on, you know, the current situation to bring in more uh, ears and eyeballs to their business, and that's probably true. But at the heart of their goal to succeed is the fact that they actually care. And these are the brands that will come out of the situation, you know, leaving a positive mark, or perhaps even build a legacy because they step. Right. Uh, point again. And uh, <clears throat> like you gave example of Lego and uh, other brands and the Scottish beer brand. Similarly, we see that the same thing happening in India also, like for example, following social distancing or diversifying the product range from uh, say, making, uh, what do you call, uh, making deodorants or perfume to launching uh, sanitizers. And also uh, many of the automobile brands, uh, uh, especially in interest Pranav, uh, many of the automobile brands have also moved into either making the ventilators yes, or they have yes. actually moved into uh, making products which are essentials for uh, the COVID-19, right? So uh, now I move to the uh, next question, uh, Barry. Yeah. Um, what are the simple ways to transform the technology, how the use of technology can be transformed further? Uh, the, uh, the micro conception, misconception about uh, digital transformation, is there any kind of mic uh, misconception that we have today regarding digital transformation? Have we understood what is mis uh, this uh, digital transformation or we are still trying to Google and understand that what exactly uh, it means? Because um, what I personally realize as a digital marketer is that uh, one is accelerating it further and some people uh, kind of misconceive it kind of a thing as we do it today, maybe tomorrow we are just going to drop it further. Okay, so that's the kind of misconception people are having. So it's kind of like, is it a fad or is it here to stay? It's kind of like... It's kind of like what people were saying about uh, social media way back in 2009 and 2010, because I remember when Facebook was at its it was nearing its peak and Twitter was nearing its peak, and I was sat with a bunch of guys and they were like, "Oh, this social media thing is just for kids. It's not going to catch on." Uh, and then here we are, 10 years later, and it has it not only has it caught on, but it actually drives a lot of our businesses forward. Um, the thing about social media, uh, sorry, the thing about uh, digital transformation, um, and it, it's a it's a term that is recently it's been it's been thrown around a lot. Uh, very loosely, especially now with the global, you know, with the pandemic and all that. Um, while most business leaders already understand that digital transformation is is critical to uh, a successful organization, a lot of them have different definitions of the term, right? So in, in today's, you know, environment, especially following, you know, whatever's happening, you know, uh, post-COVID and all that. Now, whether you are delivering a, a responsive customer experience or whether you're launching a new product or service or whether you're optimizing your operations, you need three things 
you succeed with your with your digital transformation initiatives. Right? You need the tools, you need the process, uh, and you need the culture. Right? You need all these things to enable employees to uh, sort of you know to access and analyze incredible amounts of data and then act on it and then and sort of put all those all those ingredients together. It's kind of like you know it's 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 all these amazing ingredients putting being pulled together and you're making an awesome uh, you know recipe or something. Now. To be able to survive in this competitive business uh, you know, landscape and outshine your competition, you've got to be a business that's on the cusp of technology and innovation, right? But sadly, and this is um, well, I, I got this, I got this uh, number a percentage. It's according to Bain and Company, um, only eight percent of global businesses that are currently pursuing digital transformation are getting positive results. Now, there, there's a caveat here. This is data that I got uh, pre-COVID. Uh, in, in roughly in Feb March, so I don't know what the latest stats are. I'm sure they must have uh, increased. Uh, but as, you know, in, as of February or early March, it was eight percent, only eight percent. That meant that over ninety percent of the global businesses out there are struggling to deliver on a technology-enabled business model. Right now, the pandemic obviously has pushed brands to innovate, and uh, you know, just like just as I mentioned, the real estate uh, re real estate sector switched to 3D and VR tours. Uh, you know, I have a friend of mine who runs a VR company in, in Portugal and he was doing fine for the last two, three years. But uh, when I spoke with him a, a month ago, he said, well, we're getting a lot of interest, uh, you know, for, to, to, for AR and uh, VR apps. So that is very encouraging. Uh, you know, I, three, four years ago, when I was a little bit more involved in VR technologies, I did this presentation at the university and I said, well, in future, you're going to be able to uh, go to a concert without going to a concert. And everyone's like, whoa, how is that possible? And it is possible. Uh, and, and now more so than ever, because now you're going to be able to buy a ticket online. And if, I mean, whatever happens going forward, if the organizers, organizers are allowed to do actual live concerts, this will be an additional revenue because you're going to be able to sell tickets to the live concert physically, and you're going to be able to sell tickets to the live concert virtually as well. Right? So we see all these things either happening or about to happen. And we see small businesses have already uh, started pushing you know, uh, more video content. Uh, to influence, influence uh, prospects and customers. And this is something that I was doing for the last two years, but I've noticed that a lot more people are doing it right now, which is why the algorithm is a bit wonky, especially on platforms like LinkedIn and, and, and Instagram. Uh, then we see healthcare providers, you know, like my old, my like local GP here, we're just right around the corner. It was forced to roll out an online booking system. I remember, and people will be surprised. Uh, when I moved here in the summer of 2018, when I was logging into everything and when I was signing up to different services, I asked my local GP, hey guys, do you, do you not have a website? And they said, oh, we're working on it. And it's going to be up and running in the next two months. And then two months became four months and six months and eight months. And then, you know, fast forward to March, April, within, I think, three weeks of the, of the lockdown uh, or two weeks of the lockdown being announced, the site was up and running. So like everyone's already acknowledged, the, the pandemic has really pushed brands and organizations to, to really step up their game. And all this is really encouraging, right? But the truth is, and I honestly think in most cases, digital transformation, even till date, is being used as a buzzword more than anything else. Um, you don't really become a digitally savvy organization just by adding a chatbot to your website or by automating a certain process. Um, you know, as counterintuitive as this may sound, the core of digital transformation is business transformation, right? So instead of executives asking a question like, what technologies can I add to my business to make it more digital? I think uh, the question they should, you know, the question that executives should be asking is, how can I make my business leaner using technology efficiently, right? So at the end of the day, digital transformation is about adopting a mindset, right? It's about adopting a mindset to use technology as part of your strategy to help your organization um, solve traditional problems. You know, it's, it's, it's about helping to make work easier and faster. It's about helping your employees to be more productive. Um, and ultimately, it's, it's about helping the brands and organizations deliver a more customer-centric approach, uh, customer-centric experience to their customers. Great. Uh, thanks, Barry. So uh, now I got the definition very clearly, right, that it's, we have to move away from the fad and uh, making it a fat sheet term kind of a thing. And we have to make sure that it actually helps the business and moves the business in the right manner so that we can benefit from the digital transformation and which has actually taken a, a tenfold thing post uh, the pandemic thing. Okay. And, and most so importantly, now, the mindset. The mindset, exactly, exactly, which is which plays a very important role now. 
right? The question is, uh, uh, Barry, how organizations use growth marketing and performance-based uh, marketing, uh, especially after the pandemic happening, and how it has scaled up and led to the uh, different level altogether? Um, well, yeah, I, I think um, based on what everyone else said, we were we were talking about how social has impacted uh, impacted uh, marketing. Uh, we were we were we were looking at remarketing. We we're talking about remarketing just now. I think one of the one of the problems with remarketing is there's no cap, and a lot of people don't know how to use it properly. So, because because I, I have experienced this uh, a lot of times. You know, I'll, I'll go to a website and I'll keep getting served the same ads all the time, and it happens even after I've bought that product. So I think people don't understand the usage of this. this there's, there's caps that you can use. You can say, I want to cap it to specific times in a day, or I want to cap it overall to five times in a month, or I want to cap it to 10 times. Uh, what ends up happening is, you know, advertisers tend to lose lose money on it because they don't know how to do it. But that's getting into the technical side of it. I think as a, as a growth marketing consulting company, one advice that I like to give everyone is look at your data, look at your analytics, look at your performance, right? So uh, back in the day, we used to, you know, I'm talking about 20, 30 years ago, it was all about hope marketing. And when I say hope marketing, I mean, you would run an ad campaign in a newspaper or on TV and then just hope that people would watch your commercial. And it was very hard to quantify results. It wasn't like, you know, you couldn't put a guy on a rooftop, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and look at how many cars were whizzing by uh, a billboard and say, okay, there's like 2,000 cars that passed by. That means 2,000 people watched the billboard. Or, you know, going by that mean sort of... Uh, assumption that there were four people within a household and they were watching, you know, uh, Sasbi Kabi Bahuti at 8 p.m. or whatever, or whatever time. And then assuming that that many people watched uh, your, your commercial. But now it's way more complex and it's more data driven, right? So you can break down, you can do hyper targeting, you can, uh, you know, there's, there's things called personas. And I, I highly recommend that everyone starts using buyer personas that will help you uh, it'll help you do a lot of things. One thing, it'll help you understand the, 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 the buyer behavior uh, of your prospect. And then it'll also help you sort of identify where the micro moments are. Google's got this thing called micro moments. And those are basically specific moments in time in the, in the consumer's pre-buying history where he or she decides on uh, how to act. Whether it is, I want to know more moment or whether it is, I want to go and see a moment or I want to go and buy a moment. I want to know moment is more like, I want, to, I want to research this particular product and find out more information about it. I want to go see is maybe I want to go window shopping. I want to, I want to actually see what it looks like. I want to get a re YouTube video or whatever. And then the eventual is I want to go buy a moment. That is when you go and physically buy uh, that product or service. You need to sort of fit this into your buyer persona just so you can map that pre-customer journey. And then that will help you sort of identify how your person, how your persona or how your prospect is going to think uh, and, and react. And this Kind of, it helps in a lot of ways. For one thing, it'll help you save a lot of money and time. And more importantly, it's going to give the customer a more personalized approach. Because at the end of the day, we don't want to be uh, buying things that we don't want. We don't want to be targeted for things that we don't want to buy or we don't have an interest in, right? So, some, and, and the problem with this cookie thing is, again, you know, people will just randomly see an ad, they'll click on it. They may not, in most probability, they're not interested in buying it, but they just saw a really nice ad and they clicked on it. But then, you know, marketers on the other side of the table get all excited saying, wow, these guys are interested. Let me serve him as many ads as possible. And that's what having a buyer persona and having that data driven approach will help you uh, optimize.